Well, welcome to our presentation tonight on the healing waters of Sharon Springs. It's uh, a very, it's going to cover a lot of information. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of spa treatments, and then we're going to go into a little bit more about uh, specifically the uh, spa treatments that were given here in Sharon Springs, uh, a little bit about the background of each of the different spas and the different kinds of mineral waters that we have. And, uh, and then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what it, uh, we're going to show you some pictures of, you know, what the spa treatments were like, and then we'll talk a little bit about what it is, what's happening with it today. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the spas and the treatments. They have a very interesting history with many practices and treatments dating back further than you might have imagined or thought. Often the history or origin of the concept of a spa is associated directly with Roman baths, but uh, actually predates the ancient Romans to prehistoric times. And in these times, it was thought to have been believed that mineral waters and waters rich in nutrients had healing and special powers. This means that in theory, the first spa dates back to thousands of years ago. Uh, a well-known Greek philosopher named uh, Hippocrates uh, is one of the first people to write about using water for healing and wellness purposes. These accounts date back as far as uh, 460 BC. Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates felt that many illnesses and ailments were as a result of bodily fluids and nutrients being out of balance and that the nutri uh, nutrient rich in rich and aromic baths could help heal those imbalances. The actual word spa is a word that has no clear origin, uh, or like no clear place or time. There are several theories as to where this word came from and how it came to be associated with the group of treatments for healing, health and wellness as we know it today. One theory is that spa is actually an acronym like S period, P period, A, which abbreviate, abbreviated the Latin term salsas per aqua, which translates directly to health from water. Another theory actually points to a place called Spa, which is located in Belgium and is rich in mineral springs. And these were actually known to have been uh, places of bathing and healing for Roman soldiers in ancient times. The healing of Roman soldiers was one of the first and one of the main reasons that water and baths were used for healing and uh, curative purposes. At this time, there were almost 200 baths across Rome, uh, Rome. then numbering, the numbers increased around 70 AD when those baths became known as a source of rest, relaxation and healing for everyone, not just soldiers. So the idea of going to a spa was actually popular in Japan as well and Finland um, and popularity spread rapidly across the Elizabethan era. This process using bathing as a treatment of disease is known uh, as Follow, no, I can't say this word, follow neotherapy, and is considered the founding principle of spa going. Its influence can be seen today in everything from mineral infused treatments or jumping in a hot tub after swimming, uh, or also sim, uh, swimming in salt water to heal skin. But let's talk more specifically about Sharon Springs. <coughs> Sharon Springs development as a mineral spa began in about 1825 with the establishment of the first boarding house near the spring. But its success as a fashionable resort was uh, predicated on convenient train connections and comfortable lodging. The Utica and Schenectady railroads completed in 1836 provided the rail connection. And visitors also traveled by stagecoach from the station at Palatine Bridge. They also came down the Erie Canal, stopped in Palatine Bridge, and then could take the uh, stagecoach. 
They uh, later, as the trains, uh, as more train routes opened, and there were more um, more routes that came into Sharon Springs, people would come into the train depot, which is up off of Chestnut Street here in Sharon Springs. It's still there today. They would come in by train, and then a lot of the hotels would have um, carriages that would have their hotel's name on it, and it would meet them up at the top of the hill and then bring them down to the spa area. Well, the Pavilion Hotel was begun in uh, 1836 and developed into a luxury resort by Dr. John Gardner, who acquired the Pavilion in 1842. And it was on a ridge overlooking the Mohawk Valley and the rest of the village. The Pavilion was physically and symbolically the Queen of Sharon Springs. It was because these springs and their healing properties that Sharon Springs had grown into a popular summer spa destination in the 19th century, attracting thousands of visitors annually. And I mentioned earlier about the first boarding house. Well, David Eldridge was the first to build a rooming house near the springs in the lower village. But he wasn't the first to uh, discover the, the waters. Actually, it was the Native American Indians, and they were the first to use the springs of Sharon for medicinal and healing purposes. The springs gushed from the bed of, uh, uh, of a small brook and from a steep wooded slope on its margin. Within a short distance of each other, there's five different kinds of springs in Sharon Springs. And that's really what makes Sharon Springs different from a lot of the other spa communities is that we have five different kinds of mineral waters. We have sulfur water, two different magne magnesia springs, a cleviate or an iron spring, and a blue stone spring containing elements considered valuable for treatment of eye disease, which made it popular, a popular spa destination for over 10,000 visitors every summer. And the, uh, as I said, the sulfur waters of Sharon were known and used by the Indians who brought their sick long distances to the springs. The early settlers used these as, occasional, as occasionally required. But in 19, well, it was late, actually the late 1850s and uh, the Dr. Sebastian Fonda came to Sharon Springs. Now he was a doctor that was very knowledgeable in the, the healing waters and the mineral waters. And so he came and studied the waters. He learned a lot of it from the Indians as well, but he published a book in 1860 called Analysis of Sharon Waters. And that book actually, uh, what we would call today went viral. And by the mid 1800s, uh, the spring had become world famous. Sharon Springs reached its peak as a health spa in the 1920s when it boasted some 60 hotels and boarding houses, which accommodated over 10,000 guests. And I think if you've, um, if you've listened to any of our presentations in the past, uh, we've talked about each of these hotels and how many of them, there's actually only two, um, three remaining hotels, two that are in good shape. That's actually the Roseboro and the American Hotel. The rest are in, in pretty bad uh, state of repair. Sharon Springs had hosted many of the rich and famous, including U.S. Presidents Martin Van Buren, uh, the Vanderbilts, Ulysses S. Grant, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Van Rensselaer family, Charles Dickens, James Fenimore Cooper, Oscar Wilde, and the Macy's of New York City. Well, the first of the sulfur baths were built in about 1830. And this uh, is a picture that was drawn from a description by Peter G. Harp, uh, or Sharp and John W. Becker. They described what that first spa looked like and it was drawn into an illustration. And that was in 1830. Well, the lower bath house is located on the west side of Main Street. The lower baths were built in 1876 with two parallel bathhouses. Visitors came to the lower baths and Sulphur Temple around the turn of the century, arriving in carriages, and then they stepped down into a park-like complex. 
I, I have a picture and I wish I had it because all along the hillside in the back, there was a man by the name of Henry Bang who uh, built one of the uh, premier hotels as well. It was called Congress Hall. And behind Congress Hall, uh, he had beautiful gardens and, and walking paths where people could come and enjoy the spas and then stroll through the park-like complex. Well, this 1890 photo shows the original bathhouse before the arcade entrance was added in 1903. You can see on the right that there's a wooden uh, sulfur spring temple, and that was replaced in 1930, as well as the octagon pavilion, which still stands today. <coughs> and I'll show you a picture of this is what uh, it was replaced with. And, they put the arches and it shows the arcade entrance that was added in 1930 to the, the building. And then cobblestone piers were built to support the arches and polychrome slate was put on the roof. Um, it's winter, so it's snow in there, so you can't really tell that. And then here is the, uh, this was the pavilion that had been built to replace the other one. There are actually the uh, first spa in this area had burned and then um, the Congress Hall was uh, was in this area and later what the inhalation building was built up in that same location where the Congress Hall was. But um, it's uh, visitors would, let's see. They would come and this was a, a later photo, as I said, it was about 1930. And <clears throat> this is what was inside of that. This is the uh, Sulphur Temple. And in 1927, Dr. Gardner and his son, he was the son of John H. Gardner, had built a, a Beaux Arts style uh, white Sulphur Temple that had replaced the earlier wooden one. This elaborate classical an octagonal uh, temple featured eight fluted columns topped by, a plast uh, by plastic Corinthian capitals, which supported an elaborate cornice decorated with brackets shaped like leaves and dentals. And so uh, today that wood is no longer there, but this is how people would, uh, and this was a more recent photo of it, but you can see how people would come and there, there was, there was a circle in the middle and underneath the spa, and I think we might have a picture of it later, there was a stream that flowed from the, um, it was an underground stream and it went underneath here and the water just flowed underneath this. Uh, this was the temple and then underneath it was that uh, spring. And in the center, they built a little um, area where the, the, the water would rush by and then the lady on the left was dipping water and she would dip water for the people to drink. They also had spigots that they could turn on as you see uh, going around. So <clears throat> visitors who gathered at the White Sulphur Temple stopped to drink the water's healing powers. The waters from the Sulphur Spring, most important of the five mineral springs located in the area, was popular both for bathing therapy and internal healing. And music played from speakers that were inside the chandelier ceiling. So where there's just a light bulb hanging used to be a very elaborate chandelier. And it was, this is all like Wayne's cotting. And there was a beautiful chandelier there. Uh, it's plaster moldings, trim and capitals are still seen today. The magnia, uh, mag a magnesia spring is beneath the roof just to the left of the sulfur temple. We'll see a picture of that. But you can see it's not in very good shape. Now they did do some repair work on this and they're trying to save it. But unfortunately that none of the wood that they put up there, they, they didn't paint. So I'm hoping that it doesn't you know, continue to deteriorate. But the sulfur spring still stands today and uh, it's, I, it's one of the, this is actually the logo of Sharon Springs. So if you go down uh, to the springs, you can see this is still there. You can't walk down to it. But when I first came here, I, it was open and you could walk down there. And I walked down there and 
First of all, there was a woman in a bathing suit who popped out and she was taking a bath in there. And then a little bit later, I mean, she got out of there and ran off. And then a little bit later, somebody came and was drinking out of the same water that she was bathing in. So kind of, um, you know, they really must have believed in that water. But uh, here you can see the magnesium eye water spring. On the left was the magnesia. This is one of two magnesia springs and uh, people would come and they could just drink this. And <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about that, the health of the healing qualities of each of these, but they also had an eye watering station. And uh, so the Bluestone Spring is located a few feet northwest of the Sulphur Spring, but it, and, and the interesting thing is that one spring would spout uh, sulfur water and the other one would have bluestone water. So, and um, it, it, it was in the side of the hill and it would just run out of the hill. Now, this is a, uh, this 1870 sketching shows the spring encased in a, a stone sink basin with three spigots. Now this was um, very early on. And then in the 1940s, it was covered with uh, stone and with, had a more of a rustic river rock that was set into concrete. And then later a bronze head, lion's head, uh, replaced the spigots and the, the river rock was removed and encased in cement. So, uh, and then later, as I think I showed you in the very, in the earlier picture, I can show you um, here, it's, whoops. There, it's completely gone now. And, uh, you know, all there is is just the rock that's there, but, um, The, the refreshing water uh, that would uh, flow from the lion's head, but it has long since disappeared. It was more than likely stolen and we have no idea where it went, but uh, the spring was used until about 2014 when it was roped off. And the, there was, uh, we'll talk about, you know, what has happened with the spring since, but um, all of the springs have been closed off now. So Dr. Alfred Garner, or Gardner, he was the son of Dr. John Gardner, and they, he owned the Pavilion Hotel Complex. They, were rec they recognized the value of Sharon Springs uh, curative mineral water. So wishing to expand his father's empire as a fashionable health retreat, Dr. Alfred Gardner, Gardner traveled extensively in Europe studying hydro... Uh, hydrotherapeutic med medical treatments. He returned to Sharon Springs and in 1888 built the most approved uh, methods of using sulfur water that were first introduced in the United States right here in Sharon Springs. The inhalation bathhouse was constructed to utilize the most modern European methods Ailing clients could avail now themselves of a wide variety of treatments. The inhalation building was built on the site where the Congress Hall Hotel was after its fire in 1875. In the late 1800s, there were three bathhouses in existence. The White Sulfur Bathhouse, also known as the Lower Bathhouse, the pine needle bass was also known as the uh, Bango bass, which straddled Brimstone Creek below the Magnesia Temple, and the inhalation bass. Now, the inhalation bass, you'll see, uh, look a little bit different from when they first started because later they expanded it and they added the two wings on each side in the picture on the right. Inhalation bass, uh, were facilities for douches of all kinds, uh, inhalation and pulverization. Neuerheim uh, baths for which chemical pellets were added to water causing carbonated uh, effervescence action. 
were pre uh, prescribed by those suffering from chronic heart disease. Originally, it was a two-story brick building. And then, like I said, wooden wings were added to the front facade after 1939. And a patient could sit in the sulfur gas fume room and read while receiving a treatment for lung infections. The fountain discharged a fine spray of sulfur water, which was dropped into a, a succession of shallow basins. The atmosphere was charged with gases released from the falling water. In a pulverization room was a room arranged that the particles of air would saturate with vapor or mist of the Sharon Spring sulfur water. Clothing was protected and they would wear a uh, waterproof covering and one could enjoy the benefits of sulfur vapor coming in contact without coming into contact uh, and uh, also without the need to disrobe. And you can see that they're in the inhalation building, they could be found the most approved apparatus for making direct applications of sulfurous water, pine needle extract, pine needle oil, and other medications that were, uh, that were inhaled directly into the throat, the nose, the mouth, and bronchial tubes. The machinery used was imported from France, having been selected and bought, uh, brought to Sharon Springs by Dr. Uh, Gardner, who visited the principal bathing establishments of Europe for the purpose of obtaining the fullest information on, on the topic of, of uh, mineral baths. And we're going to talk a little bit about pine needle baths. They also uh, boasted modern, uh, a modern douche facility and offered the famous uh, fango mud packs and massage treatments. And they claimed that pine needle extract was not a patent or a quack medicine. It was a pure extract that was made from the leaves or needles of the pine trees growing in the black forests of Germany. It was made only from the needles collected in the spring months when they were completely saturated with sap. And the healing of uh, uh, the healing and health giving properties of the air of pine wood and in the springtime was known to physicians and they advised their patients, uh, their patients consumption bronchitis and especially catarrhal health related issues to seek uh, and breathe air charged with the delightful odor of the pine. Now here you can see these are bottles with the pine needle crystals in them and they would put these uh, into uh, baths and they could, these were actually prescribed. You had to have a uh, you know, certain amount that you put into the water and people would bathe in those. They also use pine needle shampoo. And we have samples of this in the, in the museum. Actually, not too long ago, somebody brought me a whole case of these uh, that were left over at one of the houses that they were uh, remodeling and they packed them into cases and they wanted to be clear that they didn't want anybody um, trying to sell a uh, bootleg brand so it had to have that gardener pine needle symbol on it to to know that it came from the uh, from the gardener pine needle company and we're going to talk a little bit about now the magnesia water. And there's two magnesia spring houses in Sharon Springs. Uh, the Gardener's Magnesia Spring, which I showed you a picture of, it was adjusted, or adjacent to the Sulphur Spring. And the other was the Bangs Magnesia Temple. Now, um, this was located a short distance from the, uh, from the other, uh, with the other just north on the hillside. Now, magnesia water is beneficial for various problems of internal organs. In a full dose, it acts as a laxative, but when taken in smaller amounts, it is an effective antacid for stomach disorders. And the, the Gardner magnesia water was prepared in one pint bottles 
and used as a pleasant and effective laxative. Only one half glass to three glasses, hot or cold, should be taken one hour before breakfast, and that should do the trick, apparently, from what they say. So there was a covered walkway that was built from Gardner's Magnesia Spring behind the lower bathhouse building. The, temple, <clears throat> the temples were placed for social gatherings as well as a place to take the waters. Guests could sit on, ben on a bench, socialize and relax while taking in the aroma of the potent elixir. Now here you can see, this is the Magnesia uh, temple and uh, that is right beside the, the Sulphur temple and they could come in and uh, they could partake of the water. It would just bubble out of, again, they use that uh, a basin that is made of uh, river stone and concrete. And then this just bubbled out into, into a basin and people could just drink the water. There you can see another more recent, uh, that was about 1930. Uh, people would just uh, drink the water that way. But the most unique of all Sharon Springs temples is the elaborately ornate uh, domed Magnesia temple. Now I mentioned Harry J. Bang, he also owned the uh, Bango Bath House and the Congress Hall complex. Uh, he built this Renaissance revival style temple in 1863. And the detail of the Magnesia temple interior was quite elaborate. It uh, found it had a fountain with two lion's heads that spouted magnesia water into the pools below. Now, several hundred feet south of the sulfur and magnesia springs is the Calibia Spring, which was discovered about 1850. Now, the Calibia Springs contain iron and especially beneficial for treating anemia and female issues. And according to the book that I showed you earlier by Dr. Sebastian Fonda, who wrote the analysis of Sharon Waters, he said the waters contained a high celebrity of uh, a relief of a relief of complaints peculiar to the female sex. I thought that was interesting the way that was worded. Um, so the Calibia waters reputedly had enough iron to turn one's teeth brown. And nevertheless, it was bottled and it was sold for medicinal use. But um, in, in later years, and now look at the difference between this temple here, and this is the same temple. And uh, it was later enclosed and made as an apartment. And then in later years, it was uh, turned back into this same structure. They uh, took all of the uh, all, all of the facade off and restored it back to the original. And it's still standing today. It's in the it's in Calibia Park, and and it looks just like this pretty much now. And it's used for uh, for events and for band concerts and things like that. Let's talk about the bathtubs that were used in the spa. Well, they were from a factory of the uh, Penner and Slate Company, and they were all slate. They were selected for this use and especially desirable because of its non-absorbent qualities. Um, the gardeners rejected marble, which was many spas were using marble, but they rejected that because of its great porousness. And it was also well known uh, capacity for absorption and discoloration. So uh, they went with slate and although it was less attractive to the eye before the use, the slate remained un unchanged in its appearance after it was used. Invalids could be lowered into these tubs with a series of pulleys if they weren't able to get into the tub themselves. And the, the tubs contained layers of a boat bottom paint called safe coat, which was used to cover the surfaces from uh, and protect them from the corrosive action of the sulfur water. Acid was used to wash the, the corrosive action of the waters, and it was used to wash out the tubs. 
And then the pipes uh, to each tub were, uh, they were directly from, they came in directly from the exterior of the building. Uh, now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the facts about the, uh, the uh, Imperial bath. It actually had 96 gallons of water per minute that flowed into, uh, into the bathhouse. Now, they, uh, many of these you'll see in a, in a little later, I'll show you some pictures that there were tanks that they could hold this water. But uh, if you hold water too long, it loses some of its, um, some of its strength unless it's bottled. So they tried to not take any more in than they needed. And they would take, uh, when they had people coming in for the baths, they would uh, heat the water and it only held long enough to heat it and then move to the, uh, uh, into the baths. The sulfur water is collected and, and stored in a 350,000 gallon tank on the hillside behind the bathhouse. It opened in 1927 and closed in 2006. It closed just because, you know, it, it was um, the, the advancement of medical treatments, the, uh, the discovery of penicillin, and also the clientele changed. There were um, people that came here for the healing qualities of the water. And um, I'll, I'll show you some pictures in, in a little bit, but it became a huge Jewish community after the Holocaust. And there were, um, after the Holocaust, Germany sent the Jewish people to New York to be rehabilitated. And depending on the severity of your treatment in the concentration camp, then they would pay for uh, room and board and meals and, and the treatments. Um, and some people, depending on the severity, could only get, you know, like a, one treatment, a uh, per per week, others could get three treatments per week, just depending on your severity. Um, so the hot sulfur water was stored in four eight thousand gallon tanks, and they had a separate wing for men and for women. And there were forty three, I think that was supposed to be tubs, um, four douche rooms and four massage rooms. Fresh water was stored in three thousand gallon tanks. The Newham, uh, uh, Newham baths were given in uh, special tubs. It was uh, the sensation was like bathing in a tub of champagne. It, you become all covered with tiny bubbles. And even though the water is very cool, the body feels warm due to the vast, uh, the, the solidity, I can't say that word, vasolidation, vasolidation of the capillaries. Uh, and these are some of the, the diseases that they were traditionally uh, using the Neuheim baths for. Uh, you can kind of read through this. I, uh, they, they claim that, that uh, healing waters could do just about anything. And um, it was, uh, the, the Neuheim cubes were made in cookers in the laundry room. And these cubes were used with fresh water, not sulfur water, but, but fresh water. And then they made also made hot packs in the cookers and they had big cookers that looked like soup kettles. And then air percolators in the sulfur tubs were like, they're just like a whirlpool bath. The steam boilers used to, uh, were fired with uh, semi-soft stoker coal. And there was a coal um, room in just off the, off the back of the, the spa. It was uh, used about 500 pounds of, of coal per hour. And in 1984, the Stoker, was fire, uh, the, the Stoker fired was converted to oil uh, with fully automatic controls using 35 gallons per hour. I would hate to pay that bill today uh, at that rate. The laundry was run by steam and ironing of sheets was done with a high pressure steam and they used 100 pound mangles for pressure and in the laundry room there were four chemical washers with thousand pound vats two extractors and four 
pressure steam dryers. Now, these laundry rooms were so large that they also uh, did laundry for many of the hotels in the village. And there's only two other facilities that I know of that had laundry facilities. And one of them was the, the Roseboro Hotel. And they also did laundry for some of the other hotels. Now the hotel uh, also has a bathhouse that uh, it had two 3000 gallon tanks for water storage. Now those tanks were fired with oil and water was pumped uh, to the Adler at 40 gallons per minute. Now that water had to be pumped from across the road and over. And there were 16 tubs at the Adler, three douche rooms and three massage rooms. And there were also air percolators in the tubs that, with air supplied by three phase, five horse compressors. They used a plastic pipe and, for the cold sulfur water and steel threaded pipes for the hot sulfur water. And the steel pipes lasted about 10 years and valves only about three. And I think it's interesting that all the equipment in the bathhouse, the bathhouses, because these were summer resorts, they had to be completely taken apart and cleaned and winterized in the fall. And it took a long time. I mean, they started around Labor Day and it took them until mid-October. And in the spring, they had to put it all back together, checking all of the, the pipes for any leaks and make any repairs. And that started about April 1st and it took until uh, the last week in June is when the baths reopened. So that's just some interesting facts about the uh, the bathhouses. Now there were other bathhouses in uh, besides the uh, the Adler and the, the bathhouse, the Imperial Baths. The uh, this was actually the um, they, they called it the Sanitarium Hotel, and this hotel was uh, on the corner of Main and Pavilion. And it went by many names and they actually, you'll see uh, a side of it to the left of it is actually what they call the Parkview Hotel. And it, it had water that, that water that operated this was pumped from a well, an underground well that's actually today on the Historical Society's property. And they pumped that water over to the, uh, to the, the what they call the sanitarium. And this was all, uh, this all caught fire and burned to the ground. So this is on the vacant lot on the corner of Pavilion next to where the museum is. Uh, this was the Adler Hotel that I had mentioned. This uh, uh, opened with uh, accommodations on the lower levels where they could go for spa treatments and a few years later, a bowling alley and a billiard hall uh, belonging to the pavilion complex was converted to a bathhouse for the convenience of its patrons. But it, um, the, the Imperial bath was finished, or I mean, the Adler uh, baths in the hotel were finished in, and uh, opened in 1928. And they ran uh, in conjunction with the pavilion hotel and the Pavilion Hotel closed in 1940 and was torn down in 1941 or 42. And, uh, and in 1954, uh, Homer and, and Rosalind Spofford purchased the holdings of the White Sulphur Company, which included all the property that previously was controlled by the Gardner family. And they formed the White uh, Sulphur Bass about the same time, ownership of the Adler Hotel passed from the Adler family to Hilda, Hilda and Bernard Weider. And the Weiders sold the hotel to uh, Mordecai Yukoni in 1964. The Spoffords sold the white sulfur bass to Yarconi also in 1978. And as a result of the transfers of property, control of the sulfur mineral water rights, the bathhouses and the there were also some other hotels, the uh, Washington Hotel and the Columbia Hotel. The Washington Hotel is gone, it collapsed, but the Columbia Hotel is still there on South Street and it's in, in really bad shape. So they all of this property 
uh, was later sold in uh, about 16 years ago to a Korean company that called themselves uh, Sharon Springs Incorporated. So I mentioned that the, uh, that the baths were very popular among the Jewish people and it uh, became very popular so that um, it, they came on a, a regular basis. Many of the boarding houses and uh, rooming houses became a Jewish owned and uh, they, they were quite, they frequented the baths quite, quite a bit or they were big believers in the healing waters of the, uh, of the sulfur water and the uh, other mineral waters that were found here in Sharon Springs. Now we're gonna look a little bit at some of the inside of the Imperial bath. This is when you entered, this was the lobby of the hotel it had a turnstile that you would come in and there would be ladies at that almost like a movie theater you would come and you'd purchase your ticket and you would go into uh the spa and if you were you know female you'd go on one side one direction and if you were male you go the other way and so they had two separate wings and this is the women's wing and each of these rooms had uh a tub or you can go in and have various treatments in these rooms. Here is a doctor performing a, a treatment on one of the, uh, and this was almost like a, um, it looks like a casket because it, it divides into two and just the head sticks out and they do treatment with, uh, with the sulfur water. Here is a mud bath that is, uh, was was given this was uh done and it was a very uh popular treatment that it was done at the uh, bango hotel and it's uh it was actually a hot mud treatment and the treatments stopped when the mud was no longer available it came from europe and after or during world war ii they could no longer get the the mud so they stopped the mud treatments Here's some of the uh, thermometers that were used to uh, determine the, uh, the temperatures of the water. We have those at the museum. Here's the men's wing, and you can see uh, what they look like. It was actually interesting. Um, I didn't put a picture in here, but there's little, uh, you could only stay in these waters for, if you were taking a bath, you could only stay in the sulfur water for very short period of time because of the strength of the water. So uh, most of the time it was no more than 20 minutes, but uh, the doctor, there were doctors on staff that could prescribe treatment. Also a couple of the hotels had doctors on staff that could prescribe treatment. And then you could go over to the spa to get uh, whatever treatment that they prescribed to you. Here again is the lobby and you can see the turnstile. Uh, entrance and there's one of the ladies checking people in. Here's what one of the, the rooms look like. Again, those are the tubs. Uh, and when I, I'll show you some pictures a little bit later of what it looks like uh, present day. But um, as I said, these were all made of, uh, of slate. Now we're gonna look at the present day pictures and it's, it's really unfortunate what, uh, you know, what has happened when the bass closed. And I said, as I said, all of the property came up for sale and that included the Imperial Bath, the Adler Hotel, the Washington Hotel, the uh, Columbia Hotel and some and 88 acres of land. And then that all went up for sale and um, as, as if you've seen the, the presentation I did on the Adler, it's in, the bathhouse was not in much better shape. It really started to deteriorate. And uh, once a roof goes, it's, in, you know, it's pretty hard on it. Uh, this is what it looked like on the inside. The um, inside had, and this is in earlier 
days. Uh, this was probably in the um, uh, 19, er, 1990s, I would say. And it was still all intact. And you could see the roof had the beautiful Wayne's coating that was all oil and and it was nicely painted with all of the uh, the rooms being numbered and um, and now it's kind of as you can see gone into pretty bad disrepair uh, the tubs I asked uh, uh, one of the guys that did some work there I said you know you had so many tubs what did you do with them and he said we took sledgehammers to them and just broke them up uh, because they had they wanted to get rid of them and the new the plan is as I mentioned a uh, Korean firm bought the uh, imperial bass and they their plan was to change them into turn the whole thing into a uh, korean bathhouse and have korean clientele and the use of of uh, sulfur water and the way that they administer it is very different and a there's a modern uh, more modern technology so um, this is their plan for what they were anticipating uh the, the building looking like and it's actually changed quite a bit from this drawing from when they they first did it and uh, their plans have changed that across the way they were planning where the columbia hotel is they were planning to build a tear the columbia hotel down and build a lodging facility uh, across the way that would be more or less like a uh, motel on the across the road but uh, they had here's some pictures of the um, big boilers that were in here. Um, and this is a picture of one of the bathhouses. They envisioned at the time that they were going to make it into kind of a more rustic type of thing. And these were some drawings that they presented. Um, and they had an open house. They wanted kind of a cabin type of look to it. Uh, Oh, and this is the picture of the Adler Hotel. And this, the spas were located downstairs in the basement. There's again a picture of the, you would enter the spa. You could get to the spa from upstairs as well, but uh, anybody that was coming just for the spa could go through those doors. This is inside the Adler Hotel and it shows you uh, some of the, the spa as it is today. This is the way, as I showed you, this was the inhalation building. And they tore the two wings off that are on the right and the left of that. Uh, and they all, all that still exists today is the building in the center. So that's been torn down. This water was the only water left available to the public. And you could come, people, a lot of people came and filled jugs with this water and uh, when the Koreans bought it, they fenced this all off and closed it off. So you uh, can no longer get the healing water. <clears throat> they actually at one time only wanted the water to be available to the, pub, uh, to the public if you paid to come to the spa. But Sharon Springs uh, at the village said, no, uh, it's always been free to the public. So you must make it accessible to the public. It has not been made public yet. Uh, we have discussions to uh, to put a, we bought actually a beautiful lion's head fountain with four lion's heads on it to put at the museum, which is directly across the road. And our plans are to either pump water from the, uh, the sulfur spring over to the uh, museum property or tap into the well that is actually on the uh, historical society property. So uh, we haven't gotten that far yet because we, we just acquired the property uh, beside the museum and uh, the new fountain will go on that property. Here you can see, uh, this is kind of what, uh, that you see the arches that are of the inhalation or the uh, bathhouse here. This is what it looked like inside later um, in one of the wings. 
there again are those bathtubs and there were there were so many of them and i said it's just a shame that they all got destroyed we did save a couple <clears throat> there's one in the museum for display and there's one outside the museum or outside the bathhouse and i think there's probably some still around somewhere in the, in the uh, bathhouse uh, this is what it looked like and it was in pretty bad uh, shape so they started to tear a lot of it down and as i said there's the the temple was uh, in pretty bad shape they they are trying and they did try to fix this so it's to stabilize it and we'll see how successful that was but again there's the the this is the current day uh, roof of that temple or underneath this is kind of one of the ornate doors that went into the facility and um, this was where the boiler was kept and uh, there was also a coal room where they kept the coal. This is just a room where they had the, you can see that's a bathtub uh, in the foreground here and in the back. It's just, that's what one of the rooms looked like. These are the, some of the tanks that held the, the, the water. And this is, uh, this is what it looked like when they, then Sharon Springs Inc. took the, the, uh, the baths over. Now, this is interesting because not only um, was the bathhouse built in on whiskey barrels filled with concrete, but many of the hotels, my hotel included the, the Roseboro, was built like this. They would take whiskey barrels and they would fill them with concrete and then they would put their beams into the concrete. Well, over time, those you can see they're just sitting on the ground, and if that ground is wet, it becomes uh, they just start to sink, and that was an, a major issue with the spa. Uh, they had started to sink down into the ground, and um, and I had to actually on, on the Roseboro Hotel had to put all new footings and uh, new concrete footings, and they had to do the same thing here um, to replace those whiskey barrels. In another picture inside the bathhouse, I think so. Unfortunately, they came in and they demoed a lot of it uh, because they were planning to build a Korean spa and they didn't need all of the stuff. So they, they came in and just really pretty much demolished a lot of it. And um, as I mentioned earlier, in the temple, in the sulfur temple, there was a underground stream and it went underneath and here people could walk into this room and look down and you could see the sulfur water that was running underneath the, uh, underneath the ground. And then this same stream went underneath the sulfur temple and where that hole was and that lady was dipping water it was the same stream and they would just dip the water out of the stream that would go through. But you kind of get a concept of how the water goes under the ground. Again, another picture of the uh, entrance to the uh, bathhouse. And you can see pretty, pretty bad shape on the temple. They call these temples. Um, yeah, because, and we have uh, Clevia Temple, um, there's the uh, Magnesia Temple, this is the Sulphur Temple, and, uh, and then the eyewash station is actually, they did put something back, uh, it's actually to the left of this, or excuse me, the right of that. Here's the boilers, um, these are no longer there, but uh, they, they, they had great big tanks that, that held the water, and um there's an entrance to the bathhouse and you see the big slab they tore all of that out that was additional bathhouse that they took out um, this is the back house uh, this is the uh, inhalation building looking up towards you can see the top of the museum on the left this is the inhalation building after they tore the wings off so this is kind of what it looks like today 
Expos. Um, now this is where the boiler room was and that uh, great big chimney, which you'll see here, uh, and that slab on the left is where the, uh, the boiler house was and it housed the boilers and great big chimney that uh, they tore that all out. And again, inside the, the bathrooms or the bathhouse. Now, this is what it looked like. Um, it looks like today. They tore all of the rooms out and all of the ceiling came down and that beautiful <laughs> wainscoting ceiling. But the problem was uh, the roof had, had uh, deteriorated and they didn't take care of the, uh, the roof the way it should have. And so all of that had to be torn out because it was all uh, rotted and had to be torn out and thrown away, which was really sad. It's once a, a roof goes, a building will go very quickly. And uh, so uh, that's the reason that we had a beautiful hotel called the Empire Hotel here. And once the roof went, the center beams just collapsed and, and the whole building collapsed. Same way with the Columbia Hotel, it collapsed into the street. Um, there you can see one of the bathrooms, uh, the bath, the rooms for a bath. Uh, with one of the uh, slate tubs. This is inside the inhalation building. This is what it looks like now. They were doing some work on it. Um, this was torn out, I believe, but um, they, you can see a little bit on the left. They did, uh, they spent a ton of money and have put in a big, like a pond and some waterfalls and uh, supposedly the water was going to flow down the hill into this uh, pond and they were supposed to put a gazebo over there, but uh, none of that has come to fruition. So, um, and here you can see some of the work that they've been doing. And this is the, uh, this is what it looked like when they, they got it. Uh, so, you know, people might ask, so what's the, you know, what's happening with the bathhouse and, um, you know, what's the, the status now? Well, when the Koreans bought it about 16 years ago, there was a whole group of investors. And as I said, it was a group called Sharon Springs Inc. And, or Incorporated. And over the years, uh, various things happened. There was a lot of discord within the group. There was some embezzling that went on. And Finally, one man by the name of Kim Sin Cho um, took over, and he is the sole was the sole owner of this this whole project, and so he ended up um, wanting to turn this. He owns a Korean bus company in New York City, and his plan uh, was to bring uh, uh, buses up here from New York City of Korean visitors. And they would take baths at the at the in the Korean baths, and uh, they had gotten grant money, and they had worked with uh, with uh, some historic grants to get get start to work on it. And some various things happened, and it actually uh, they lost some of the the money. They were planning to spend about thirteen million dollars in renovating this. And then um, they lost the grant or the, the their loan money, and it, so then they had to go back and try to get some more investors. And they haven't today, as of today, been very successful in getting any new investors. They said they had one, but um, the project has come to a complete standstill. If anything had been done, they did a little bit of work last spring on the on a deck out back. Uh, of the bathhouse, and then that uh, came to a halt because they didn't have a permit for the work that they were doing, and so um, all of the they had a stop work order put on, so all of the work came to a halt. And the other reason was that they wanted to change the design of the plans that they had. Uh, they have they keep changing the design and. Uh, they have to, in order to get this approved, it has to go through the proper channels and it has to go through uh, the planning board and, you know, has to go through the village and they have not done that. They've just gone ahead and either made plans or 
Uh, and so they finally said, look, you need to finish the original design and the plans that you submitted. And if you do that, then we we'll allow you to move forward. But my understanding is that Mr. Cho ended up with uh, cancer now, and his son is supposedly uh, going to take over the project. But uh, we heard that like last fall, they were going to have 65 people come up here and and start working on it. And they were going to, you know, really go gun ho on it, but that never materialized. And so um, as of today, it just sits there and uh, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's up in the air. So uh, so that's the, the status on that. And uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to questions. If you have questions, you can either uh, either ask the questions in the chat or uh, let me see what we've got any. So for these, these were, um, I ask, are these uh, springs hot springs or cold springs? These are cold springs. They keep a consistent 48 degrees. And uh, it's not like in some places where you go when you have the hot water springs. So um, yes, many of the hotels did catch fire as, uh, as Kathy Moon had mentioned, yeah. Are there any plans to renovate, restore the springs that have been closed off? And as I said, we're working with the, the Historical Society would like to put that, we're building a new museum, um, which has a, well, not a museum, but a, a new historical village. And as part of that historical village, we would like to run that uh, water across and have the, the healing waters. We're also putting in a synagogue uh, with all of the materials that came from the synagogue that was in Sharon Springs that was sold recently. And the man that bought that donated all of the interior of the uh, synagogue to the historical society. So we're building um, a whole village and we will have a, uh, a synagogue as part of that. And we're actually working on another project to have a whole new museum over back there. So we'll see how that turns out. Did a number of the patients with tuberculosis ever go to the Springs for a cure? I'm sure they did. Uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt came here for his cure, uh, or both the Roosevelts were here. And the interesting thing about my coming to Sharon Springs was I had no idea when I came here that really what Sharon Springs was famous for. And I moved out here and I brought a trunk and in that trunk, I had uh, some old postcards and I pulled out an old postcard from my great, great aunt and uncle. And in, on that postcard, which I should have shown you a picture of it, uh, it said that they had been to the healing water. My, my great, great uncle had a lot of rheumat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, was just really crippled up and they came here for the bass. And so... Uh, I actually had some connection to that, which I didn't even know. Are there any of these slab tubs still available for purchase? Um, I don't think so. I'm, I don't know if they would sell any. I think that they're trying to, you know, anything that's left, they're probably going to keep. Um, okay, let's see. What was bluestone water used to cure? It was for eye wash, and they used that to, uh, for a cure for um, eye ailments. So anybody that, and also headaches. Um, I actually, there, uh, so I'm just posting now some new videos. There was a, a group that came, it's called History on the Road, and they produced about uh, 11 videos, and they, they did different vignettes of, uh, they're all up about a half an hour segment of Sharon Springs, and there is one on the spa. But uh, the woman that was filming that, she went into the, and she claims that she uh, put this, she had a terrible migraine and she put that on her, on her forehead. And a little later, her migraine was completely gone. So she kind of swore by it. And you'll, you'll see that in that video. Uh, can you share a little more detail about what brought Jewish community sh to Sharon? Well, as I said, uh, you know, it, it, it was the, after the Holocaust, they were sent here by the, uh, by the German government to 
New York, and no one would take, none of the other spa towns would take uh, the Jewish people. And if you remember back, um, and you may not know this, but back um, in the, oh, after the Holocaust, many Jewish people were, were banned from coming to uh, many resorts and hotels. And at one time, it, they were very well uh, wealthy Jewish people, and they would come, and then they would, then after that, uh, they no longer allowed them to come, but Sharon Springs said, we will take them, and so they came to, the, uh, they allowed them to come to Sharon Springs, and uh, it became a huge uh, Hasidic community, and later on, um, we had a, uh, oh, shoot, um, there's another kind of Jewish uh, uh, Jewish sect, and I'm just flipping my mind, it starts on the nest. Um, but anyway, uh, they came here and it became so popular as a, a Jewish community that many of the Holocaust survivors stayed at the other hotel. And Steven Spielberg, when he was filming Schindler's List, came to Sharon Springs to interview many of the Holocaust survivors uh, who were staying there. So, um, and they, I was told that so many Jewish people uh, were here that uh, if you didn't start garbage pickup by five in the morning, you couldn't get through the streets because they were just, uh, it was just, you know, tons and tons of, of Jewish people. But as they grew older and the older people died off, the younger people didn't want to come here. And we don't have any uh, there's, you know, there's no, uh, there's only one Jewish boarding house that's still in existence, and it's not uh, a boarding house, it's a, a rooming house, and the difference between a boarding house and a rooming house is that a, a boarding house, um, they didn't provide meals, uh, or they provided meals, but in a rooming house, they had um, stoves or refrigerators, and they called them kukulain, which is a Jewish word, or Hebrew word. Um, it's a word that means uh, uh, where you can have a stove and, a, you know, and cook in your room. So uh, many of the uh, Jewish people like to come and stay in those, but there's only one left that's remaining that I'm aware of, and that's the Brussman House. And the uh, uh, and then now none of uh, there's no Jewish people that come here uh, because of uh, it's it's changed so much. Um, you know, that they're, they just have no interest in coming here anymore. So, uh, and the synagogue is gone. So once the synagogue was gone, there was really nothing. They came here for, uh, Joel Pe Teitelbaum stayed next door at the Central Hotel. And because he was very involved with um, helping people get out of the Holocaust, he was uh, pretty much a, you know, what they considered a, almost a saint. And they would come and want to, uh, see him or stay where he was, uh, where he stayed. And so uh, none of that's there anymore. So, you know, there's no real reason for the Jewish people to come from a religious standpoint. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's it. And I hope you learned a few things. It, uh, uh, you know, there's always more to learn. And we've got some really interesting presentations coming up. Uh, we've got one, our next live presentation is going to be on February 13th, and that is about um, metal detecting and uh, items that have been found. It will be both uh, a Zoom and a live presentation. It'll be live at the Sharon um, Free Public Library in the community room. So thank you all. and. Uh, have a very good evening. We'll see you in our next production.